welcoming. Um, you know, they'll send resources, they'll help out, they'll tell you what's going on. And it's just, it's so much to learn. So I'm very grateful um, for it. And I'm very grateful to be here as well. So thank you for having me. Uh, but I want to welcome Nina Ali and I want to welcome Meredith Patterson here as um, the two panelists that we'll be speaking with. How are you two doing today? I'm going to go with Superb. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Happy Saturday. Happy I'm doing all right. It's nighttime in Belgium. But... Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't even realize that it was so, I didn't realize you were in Belgium, but that would I make am. sense. I'm in Brussels. <laughs> I, okay. Uh, it'll be 10 years uh, this spring, actually. Nice. Nice. So um, would you all, I'll start with Meredith, Meredith, would you give a brief background about yourself um, to the audience here? All right. Well, um, my academic background is kind of all over the place. Uh, my degrees are actually in linguistics. Um, and the, um, you know, my first real touch with the biology world was an internship that I had while I was working on the PhD in computer science that I never finished. Um, but, uh, I, was, I was a bioinformatics intern at Integrated DNA Technologies. And uh, Gadi, just to clarify, that was actually the, um, that, that was actually the, the incident where I just busted out and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, separated, you know, like lysed and separated DNA on, on stage. That was at CodeCon in 2005. IDT flew yeah, out I confused there. it, but it was still you, so... I mean, like, the story has probably gotten around. <laughs> but, yeah, it was great. Use the salad spinner as a centrifuge. Okay. Isn't a salad spinner at the end of the day a centrifuge? It is a centrifuge. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm saying. And I really, Although you know, I'll call the Iranians <laughs> for the nuclear program for a second here. Yeah, I, I see you. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, some centrifuges are, are fancier than others, but yeah, that was really my introduction to, uh, you know, to bioinformatics. Um, and then uh, while I was living in the Bay Area, I was um, pretty heavily involved in, you know, the, the, the early days of the, the synthetic biology biohacker scene. There's, there's kind of a distinction between that and the the grinder scene, which is more about the like installing technology in one's body, and like you know, there's there's no there's no prejudice, right? Like you know, I've got plenty of friends who have like an RFID in their fingertip or whatever, and who actually use it, like you know, as a you know to unlock the doors wow. to their house or whatever. Um, but yeah, I haven't I haven't gone that far. The, the The closest I am to a cyborg at this point is that I have an IUD, and I have you know, off and on for quite some time. And, you know, I think that's, I think that's something that people kind of, you know, fail to recognize, right? You know, because they think, oh, it's a medical technology, but, you know, it's, it's an implanted device that prevents pregnancy incredibly reliably. You know, I think that's pretty cyborg. My, my parents have both had lens replacements in their eyes. That's pretty cyborg. Meredith, you have no idea. IUDs and LASIK and where you categorize them was one of the two of the questions I was going to ask you. Oh, not even LASIK. They had their they had their whole straight up lens. Yeah. Out. And my dad has like bad astigmatism and nearsightedness like I do. I can't wait. Like I talked to my ophthalmologist last visit about like, you know, can I is, is this going to be an option for me? And then we're like, let's talk about it your next visit in two years. So fingers crossed. Nice. And lovely Nina. Let's hear it. I like the intro of Let's Hear It. Um, <laughs> so my, my introduction to life, um, 16 years in the New York City hospital system working on electronic medical records and eventually the IoT connected medical devices. And I worked primarily in surgical oncology. So it was like 13 different EMRs in one place and putting them all together so that there was one communication for the physicians to do the right things for the patient at the right time for the right surgical EMRs are electronic medical records. Yes. Thank you. Because I tend to think everybody knows what's in my head. I do that. Um, so what else have I done? Um, I worked on microfluidics project for sexually transmitted infections and that did not go anywhere because the government was like, oh, that's cool, but we need uh, proof of concept and data. And I was like, that's, we're here, guys. I need your money for that. And didn't do anything with it. So end of that is 
biohacking takes on different forms. There was another comment here about, is it medicine or isn't it medicine? I think we're at the point in life where we recognize that garage science and just as an FYI in the United States, garage science has been signed into law by President Obama saying we need to look at it and get into it and do the things and bring it into the government and bring it into the manufacturing side and actually do something with it. Um, so that's something that I, at the Biohacking Village, us, the we, try to empower the, the manufacturers, the big pharma medical device manufacturers to do with the garage science, with the biohackers, biotech, biosec, DIY bio um, technology folks. Garage science. Um, so what is garage science? It's, it's literally what I was doing with the microfluidics project. I was in a lab that was not um, at BSL level, so biosafety level zero, we'll say for right now. Um, but as is all garage science and all the good things come out of garages, right? So we were building out a plastic piece of nothingness that did like nanoscale um, cellular apparatus thing where we put urine, saliva, all of the body liquids, let's be very clear, right? Um, liquid tissue in there and went through different parsings to determine if the person had um, an STD, an STI. Garage science is those places where a lot of the biomanufacturers get their ideas and start their sciences from. It's people that are from very different backgrounds coming together and learning the things that they have to learn to make whatever it is work. And in the US, that's actually something you can do. Like, I, I really have not been actively involved in anything biohacking related since I moved to Europe, just because, you know, there is that requirement that you have a BSL-1 lab minimum. And the, the, the catch is that basically none of the countries have a process set up for just a regular individual to, you know, to go through that process. You know, they have a process for universities, they have a process for companies. Um, I know of one guy in Ireland who has, you know, who managed to go through it as an individual. And, you know, like there's a couple places in France and elsewhere that have, you know, that have managed to get their workspaces certified, um, you know, as organizations. But it really clamps down on the ability for actual individuals in their garage to experiment. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, in, in some cases, like the, the folks who do this in the, in the Bay Area, like it's actually their day job also. It's but but, you know, being able to come home and work on something, even even though it's fully acknowledged you have all the skills to do this, you know, and somebody is paying you to do it during the day, like just the ability to come home and, and you know, continue to use those skills is, you know, kind of kind of rare. So, Najla, what have we got? What uh, what are we doing today? We got a lot. We got some questions. And I think that it's very important, especially with, you know, way, the way the world is right now. So my very, very first question is, you know, we're, we've, we're, we've been in a pandemic for the past year, right? So how has that changed for you personally? And how has that perspective changed? Um, how has your perspective on it changed for biohacking? You know, I'll let you go first. Zero percent prep time. I like it. Um, how has my perspective changed? <sighs> um, I, or, or if it hasn't, that's fine too. No, 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 no. Um, so right before DEF CON last year, I had COVID and I was exhausted all the time. And I had, I, I got through it right before DEF CON started. And I, at the time I lived in a loft and I had 16 stairs and I, I remember going up the stairs one of the days of DEF CON and I was like, I'm exhausted. I need a nap. I don't care what happens today. I need to go to sleep. Um, but I think for me, it's, it's imparting a little more patience and kindness on people. Of, I, I've, I've done it before. Like, I don't know what's going on in your life, but I also know that I don't need to be a further impediment in your life. And it's that we have to help each other more than we already were. We were a great community before, and I think with everything that's gone on, we've become better at understanding each other and having the conversations, the humanity came back a little bit more in my eyes. Agreed. Meredith? My observation is more political. I mean, we've, we've seen that 
with a committed effort, um, you know, the red tape that it normally takes to get it to roll the vaccine out um, has has been sliced through in under a year in both the U.S. and Europe um, and in quite a few other countries as well. And that's kind of impressive, particularly given how much red tape there is over here. Um, you know, we're, we're, still ta we're still lagging behind the U.S. in terms of distribution. And I don't have any really great observations about that. But, you know, it's, it's nice to see that the, that the bureaucracy, like, you know, can do its job without mucking, you know, without slowing things down too much. And that's totally understandable. I think, you know, depending on where you are in the world, you're seeing different differences. Um, and I think that, you know, as we move forward, what would you say are your top two concerns with, you know, the new biomedical technologies and devices with the vaccine rollout policies? There's a lot at stake here and there's a lot at play here. You have policies changing, you know, by the minute sometimes and sometimes by the second, you know, one policy is in effect one day, the next day it's a, it's a quick, quick policy change. Um, so what do you, what do you, <laughs> what are your, what are you seeing in Europe? Like, what are you seeing in, in, in Belgium? Like, how is that over there as, as far as, you know, the concerns that you're seeing? And you can give more than two if you, if you we've been, like, we've been under curfew since, um, mm -hmm. like, October of last year. And that got lifted, um, like, a little bit before December, and then it clamped back down again. And it's still going on. And it's different in different regions of the country, which, you know, is... is we're, this is Belgium. We're talking about that is actually potential like constitutional crisis level issue. If, you know, Brussels, this region has to stay indoors from 10 PM to, to 6 AM, but the rest of the country can stay out from midnight to five. So it's definitely differences uh, um, amongst the countries in the different areas. I, I, the states are the same way. Like I, I really think it's just states for themselves at this point. Like, you know, a lot of it I'm seeing is, you know, guidelines and not mandatory. So they're, they're changing what they're saying. And it's, it's been a quite crap show, honestly. Nina? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really Both interested Claire? to hear from like the public health, uh, you know, mm -hmm. from, you know here, from, from like the public health folks on the law, on the front lines, administering vaccines, like, you know, what are they learning? Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you my, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I've, I work in a lab that does the we were heavy on COVID testing um, when all I think from like maybe August to and we just let up maybe February. So I think I, we were getting we were running like 300 samples a day. And that's a lot for a small independent laboratory. Um, and so a lot of people were coming to us because we were turning results around within 24, like 12 hours, we would have your results back out. Um, even though, you know, there was a price to it. And then if your insurance reimbursed you, then fine. Or, you know, if they reimbursed us, fine, it's still covered. Um, but you had to pay up front. But now I think with the vaccine rollout, it's, it's a lot less. We're getting maybe a third of what we were getting before. Um, so I think that people are definitely taking the time to go and get that vaccine. Nina? I have three thoughts. Um, bringing men they're a little political, right? Um, bringing manufacturing back to the U.S. because eighty to ninety percent of all of our medical pharmaceuticals devices are made out of this country. Mm -hmm. So they are. There's legislature coming back, coming down, saying we need to bring that back, and they're looking at Puerto Rico to do this. And my family is from Puerto Rico, so I have a lot of concerns about that. And one of them is, what are you going to do with the EPA laws? You can't just make things and throw all the things into the water and break the, the mountains, et cetera. Um, and I, I am a big proponent of discussing decision failure. I want to know what the decision tree mm. was. I want to understand everything you went through so that I know that your decision was not made lightly. Um, and the other thing is funding of ideas. There were so many ideas that came down uh, at the start of the pandemic, middle of the pandemic. I and and where did funding go? How were things funded? What are the results, et cetera? Things like that. So, what do you think is new in the biohacking, you know, community? What 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 would you say is new and and do you do you see it taking off like exponentially, or um, what are you seeing in biohacking? Yeah, I think this pandemic has shown everyone that we 
that medicine is not just med- medicine. Mm-hmm. Um, even the way that we look at medicine, you go to your primary care physician and they're like, cool, you have something. I don't know what it is. Go to the infectious disease doctor. Oh, you're also a woman. Go to the gynecologist. We've siloed everything. And we've also siloed IT and uh, information technology and information security in uh, medicine. So we need to start putting everything together so that we can have that commonality and discussion of everything that's going on, bringing in all of the, the cybersecurity experts from the outside in to help fortify that rather than just, you know, we know everything, we're going to figure it out. ICS is involved, like you said, ICS is involved, logging devices, humans are at the beginning and end of this. We need to take that into account when we are making things, including decisions. Big communication. I think communication is at the, at the core of that instead of, you know, being scared to share, you know, your bad things that have happened and just displaying the good, you're not going to get anywhere because sometimes people will keep running the same, the same race. And instead of just communicating within your same industry and across companies and saying, Hey, we've had this issue and we see that you're having this issue. It, it, it hasn't been happening. So I'm, I'm looking forward to more collaborative efforts as well. Meredith. Did y'all see that article um, a week or two ago about the, uh, the cousins who own the the company that produces like 90% of the the nose swabs that are used for covid tests like puritan medical products i think they're in like maine or something i think i did yeah like these two guys can't stand each other <laughs> <laughs> but but the us government basically had to loan them a ton of money to be able to scale up their process for making nose swabs because you know, they were the only people that like had the technology for it. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, did see this, I saw this story and I couldn't help but thinking, think that like, this is where generational feuds come from is, and like, we're just, we're just creating one over nose swabs. And, and I, I, <laughs> like, I can't wait for where, where this will be in like five years. Well, I mean, few few family-owned companies make it to the third generation precisely because, you know, mm-hmm. once you get to, like, you know, cousins rather than brothers, it's a lot easier for people to get into conflict, which seems to be what's happened here. But, you know, that ha- it has implications for, like, you know, U.S. resilience. Fair. So, I, mi- I know Gotti mentioned so cotton about swabs chips. are, sorry about that, I just wanted to understand. Are you saying that cotton swabs are critical infrastructure? Uh, well, at, in, at this point, the nasal swabs, they're not, co- they're not cotton swabs. They're, they're electrostatically flocked using some, some trade secret process. I mean, the like, is, the thing is they stick up your nose when they're testing you for COVID. It's the worst thing ever. Don't, uh, no, we don't didn't do, have enough do not recommend, do I not recommend. I had that bad, but I had to have a, <laughs> I had to have a fiber optic camera up my nose when I had my tonsils out. I mean, I guess that's another, that's, that's Wait, another. Moving on very quickly from that. So <laughs> I do know that me personally, Why as would well we move as on from uncomfortable medical things we are on this moving episode? on from that. It reminds me of the startup when, uh, uh, what's the, the name of this fish that, that everybody is fears, like the huge teeth and the light here, you know, the. Oh, I'm squeaked out. I don't want to hear it anymore. <laughs> yeah, so so uh, my my uh, co-founder Irene decided to make that our mascot, and I was like, nope, nope, not gonna happen, not gonna happen. Almost quit. Angler so fish. Yes. angler fish. Oh my god, it's horrible. Anyway, but the thing is, you know, you are experts, and you do s- cool, such cool stuff every day. And I'm like, what is this thing that you're doing? Why are you doing it? Why is it so cool? It's cool. It's not even that. It's cool. It's important. It's important work. Um, whether we like it or not. And sometimes what it's... What is this work if it's so important? It's it's advancing our everyday life. It's not just about, you know, advancing medicine. It's about advancing every aspect of our life. You know, it the everything just touches our life, whether we realize it and how minuscule we make it or how large we make it. Everything touches our life. So it's not just about, okay, let's what's the new hot technology? No you have to think about second and third order consequences of what things will do um, as far as this work. So um, yes, it can be frustrating and yes, you may not necessarily agree with it and people are going to challenge you, but what's the fun in that? If people aren't challenging you and not agree with it, you got to, you got to make it um, somehow, some way. You know, you've been been asking. Oh, 
Oh, I was just gonna say, could I could I actually like re- rephrase it slightly? Because this is something that I'm I've been wondering is sort of what would you say like the parameters of uh, of biohacking are versus a couple of like adjacent things like medical research or you know like what what makes it different in in some ways from medical research like what sort of yeah, what adjacency is kind of the wrong relationship to to think about here right I mean there's there's a Venn diagram here like you know, uh, there's mm-hmm. go ahead Meredith. Um, like, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a grinder position, which isn't usually mine, right? Um, yeah, the 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 body modification field, you know, has people in it who have developed their skills, you know, in you know, not not in an academic way, um, but they have through practice, and you know, they've pioneered techniques, you know, for, for things like implants. And you can't really differentiate between, you know, those skills and like, you know, a surgeon who's implanting a subdermal device for some other reason. Um, Apart from, you know, how did they learn them? Thanks on that. Go ahead. Yes. Expand, that's one please. of my favorite concepts to talk about. <laughs> so I, I do have, I have three implants and I tell that to everybody. You need so much more knowledge rather than just, I'm just going to stick my pen up into my arm and see what happens. You have to have biocompatible plastics or glass or whatever thing it is, because it's not like you're going to shove your iPhone into your arm just to see what happens. You, you need it to be a thing. Um, going to your question, the, is it, is it medicine or is it not? Everything is connected to your health. At least for me, it is, right? Um, if you do not feel well, you're not going to work. If you don't work, you're not having an income. You're not, then you don't have health care. Or at least in this country, it's such a vicious cycle. Um, whereas in other countries, they, they're they better. They understand that you need health care to have your job for the income, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, medicine matters. The way that it's, it's given to people, um, I have a lot of issues with because it's, it's so imperfect and it's, if you don't have it, it's so costly when there's so much, there's so many different ways to have it and get it that are, that are more efficient, effective, et cetera, especially now with um, digital medicine coming down mm-hmm. um, from the pandemic, everybody has the opportunity to work from home and get medicine from home simultaneously. But again, all of those things were made so fast and so quickly that security parameters were not embedded directly into that. So now it's a catch-up game. Of, oh, yeah, you know, totally. I, I, also I, work definitely, on, I also work on EMRs. We can suddenly practice wherever we want. It's, right. <laughs> it's, it's it, the, telehealth, the telehealth industry is like booming right now. And it's just like... I, I, we, I'm gonna, security, I'm, wasn't, I'm security wasn't like thought about in there at all. And now yeah. it's like slowly coming to the forefront. So with that, and we're talking about all of this and now everyone has access. um, Is there any bias in all of this? And if there is, where do you think it comes from? Where does it manifest from? Go ahead, Nina. I got, I see you. Give me, I'm gonna high five you there. (laughs) So I'm from New York city. They, everybody thinks that there's, there's no issues in New York city because there's so much Wi-Fi and all these other things in rural have a lot of issues, but there's, it's the same issue. It's the same um, mm. internet issue because one, you're in a high rise with a stack of 60 million other people. And then over here you have 60,000 miles and one person per however many miles. Um, so that's one of the failures of telehealth. The other failure of telehealth is they haven't changed the parameters on the back end for CMS, mm. uh, Centers of Medicare and Medicaid and Medicare Services, which is the main uh, payer in the United States. They still charge for in-person visits. I think it's $60.32, but for a telehealth visit, it's like $30.92. So we're not giving doctors the, 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 the impetus to have people do telehealth. We're Wait, doing did you know? Let me add that to you. I, I recently went to the doctor. Did you know they charge per the time they talk to you? So if yeah. it's 20 to 29 minutes and then 30 yeah. to 39 minutes, I had no idea until I actually- seen an anesthesia. There's, there's codes yeah. for that. Yep. And I was, I was mind blown. <laughs> 
even beyond that, like I, I also live in New York and I've been trying to help people get vaccine appointments who are eligible, but many of them are not nearly techy enough yep. to be able to get these appointments. Like it's, um, but I am, yes, I, I would love to hear more about some of these like biohacking implants. Um, and like Nina, depending what yours are, I don't, if they're, if they're private, I don't want to ask about them, but if you want to talk about them, I'm very curious about them. I don't think I have the cool ones. I have the RFID, the NS. NFC. And then I have one up here that um, I worked on with somebody because I wanted my EMR implanted in my arm because I travel a lot and I wanted to have a way that I could have all of my information with me. The problem was that when it went in the pocket wasn't long enough, so it canted and it broke some of the electronics in it. So, but I also wanted to see how it would, um, how it would heal because I heal horribly. Um, one of the cooler, um, Implants. Those are all pretty cool, but <laughs> please tell us what the coolest is. <laughs> One of the cooler implants that I've seen is from Grindhouse Wetware. I'm sure Meredith knows them. Um, they, I think it was here. It was it was in their the, the back of their palm. It was massive. It was like the size of an iPhone. They just put, it was either forearm or, or here. Either way, it just lit up. They just wanted proof of concept that something could go in there and, and it would show up and be great. And eventually they moved it over to doing, um, I think it was temperature, blood ox, um, so blood oxygen, and maybe heart rate too, I think. And it, it had a, a Bluetooth connection to the phone so you could monitor how well you were doing. And then that led to other implants. I'm not gonna lie. I prefer my I, I prefer my ex computer interfaces, you know, you know, whatever part of the body to to be non invasive. Um, I, I I did go nuts on like you know a smartwatch that can track uh, you know continuous heart rate and atrial fibrillation, um, and you know take an ECG on my wrist because um, I have some kind of congenital tachycardia that doesn't really you know, cause any problems, it does, but, but it does fire every once in a while. So it's nice to be able to, it's nice to be able to track that. Do you have a rec on, on favorite smartwatch then, or? Uh, I, this is, this is the, uh, the Withings uh, ECG watch. Awesome. They used to be part of Nokia and then spun out into their own company. They're, they're based in France, but they're actually like FDA approved and EU approved for monitoring AFib. Awesome. Nina looks very excited about something. Did you want to add one thing? I have one more and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to Harbison. I don't remember his name. Harbison is his last name. He's colorblind. He was born colorblind and he's got like an antenna coming out of his head <laughs> that is implanted in his brain. And if you tell him to look at something, he sees it in the complete ultraviolet um, ray of color. It's amazing. And he's got a bust. He's Spanish. He's got a bust of himself in one of the museums in Spain. And if you put, like I'm in the kids room right now. So if you took this and put it under his, um, his bust, it will stop him in the middle of the day to alert him that something is there and he'll, it'll send the, the picture to him and he'll look at it and he'll tell you what color he sees. Wow. Oh, that's, I'm, okay. that's, that's awesome. That's I like, love that. That's cool. <laughs> oh, really is that cool? Oh, the looks on everyone's faces on the call, as you said that, I was like, oh, what? <laughs> I mean, my dad just got the glasses. You know, my dad's colorblind, but. I didn't realize there were glasses either. I, I'm not colorblind. If I, if I am colorblind, I don't know I'm colorblind, I should say. You're probably so, not. It tends to be the more, it tends to be the case in men more often. Right. Yeah. Got it. So we do, so we're finding that, are you guys finding that, um, people who implant themselves, is it more so for useful and practical? Or do you think that a lot of people are, you know, doing it for the fun of it? And do you see it like becoming heavily, you know, maybe regulated to be like mandatory or just, you know, you can do it and you can collect your data for yourself and things like that? Well, I mean, there's absolutely going to end up being regulation. I mean, Elon Musk wants to wants to develop a uh, you know a transdermal um, uh, brain computer interface, which honestly honestly scares me to death. I would much rather go with uh, uh, I, I would much rather go with um, like um, EEGs and uh, you know feedback through that. Like if, if, if your goal is to, to control computer, like this ought to be possible. 
Um, and that is something that I, I, you know, that I plan to be playing around with uh, once I can make it to Houston and pick up the um, the uh, Open BCI uh, 32 node EEG kit that I had to order to my parents' house. I have it. It's amazing. <laughs> Fantastic. I am looking forward to playing with it. What is what is the Open BCI? How far? Kit? Go ahead. What is the open I forget BCI the I kit? Nina, go to. Do you have it handy? Like, can you? No, I'm, I'm, I put my hands. I do this. <laughs> oh, oh, no, no. Okay. I was just saying, like, if you have it, like, you know, you can, you can tell them more about it. You know, it's. It's, it's brain connectivity interface. And it's like a little net that you can do the things with and do the things with. You put it on and it connects. I believe it's Wi Fi. I don't remember right now. And it tells you the, the, this. I mean, it's basically, it's basically got the, it's, it's got, you know, sensors at each of the, the, the cap has sensors at each of the, the, the uh, areas that you're supposed to put a sensor for an EG and it's soft and you can wear it around. Um, and yeah, there's just a, there, there's a small device uh, that, you know, reads all 32 channels. Um, oh, that's cool. I've played with the, the Muse, I think it was called. Yeah. Uh, this is a little mm -hmm. head thing, and it, it's it's super cool. Like it, it comes with like a little meditation app, and like you can see your your different um your different brain waves. Um, and I know the I know the guy who wrote their uh, their SDK. Oh, it's it's so cool. <laughs> it's really fun to play with, Daddy. Yeah, I, I'm just sitting here and listening to you guys. It's kind of like being with the experts on a topic that's extremely cool, and listening to the experts talk to each other. And you might not understand everything, but you understand there is a higher level of abstraction here that they care. For example, the way you are engaged with the regulation around this and the tools around this and how it's important and imperative for the world, that's a higher level from my understanding. And I'm, I'm feeling excited and honored to be here. But I would like to ask to take a step back for a second. Let's assume I'm a, I'm a complete noob, which I am, and I'm coming into the biohacking village, right? And I'm saying, what's biohacking and how can I be a part of this? What do you do? What's so cool about this? What Nina, would you guys say? I'm going to give you like the three minute spiel that I give everyone. So, um, thank you. That was interesting, but I'm not sure you bought me on that. Just three minutes <laughs> scares me. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so, the Biohacking Village has been around for six years or seven years, I think. This is my six year running it. Um, the first year, it was nine talks and two demos. And over the years, um, because of the hospital work that I've done, I've tried to build it out to be more inclusive of the entirety of the ecosystem. So if you walked into the village, it's three different rooms. Um, so we have a medical device room where we set up a pseudo hospital and everything is interconnected. And the hacker community comes in and has a face-to-face one-on-one with the manufacturers. And they can, the hackers can work off of on the the devices and give them the vulnerabilities or whatever issues are going on. So there's real time um, CVEs done, real time uh, disclosures. And that happens. And then we have the speaker lab, people come in, talk about emerging threats, talk about new technology, all the cool new stuff. Um, the uh, Boom, I went blank. The, um, the things that have happened. And then we have the Catalyst Lab. And that came about because the government wouldn't fund me. And I have a problem with that. So what we do there is pre-seed companies come in, talk about what they're working on. Hopefully the manufacturers come in, venture capitalists, the government gives them, um, we're working on getting the government to do objective one-on-one -on -one, non-binding advice so they can get moving forward. And then either seed funding or venture capital funding from manufacturers, hopefully mentorship, hopefully getting picked up by the manufacturers. So all in all, it's bringing together the entirety of the ecosystem so that we can have, we can start ourselves reimagining and reinventing what healthcare looks like. Does, does DARPA fund much investigative bio work or is that mostly like NIH? DARPA has a BTO office, so biomedical. Uh, I think it's biotechnology office on their own. I, I spend I spend more of my time with the with their information office uh, because Langsec. But yeah, I mean, I would imagine that that they would probably be a lot easier to you know 
to interest in things than 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 NIH or FDA. You know, the penny um, just dropped that I honestly don't know what biohacking is. When I met people doing biohacking, they were other hackers or biologists or whatever, doing cool stuff and showing that you can do stuff with your body and there are things you can do. It kind of was underground almost. And when I listen to you now, you're almost like trusted advisors working with the government, trying to change the future. And I'm like, awesome. But what happened to all this underground stuff? Like, I, I was wondering, you know, when, when Karen asked about your implants, like, is it like asking about tattoos or is it as, as more rude? Like, are people still about, uh, let's hack our bodies, let's do cool shit, or it's all about, let's make the world better with uh, medical stuff? I mean, it's both. Think, it's not mutually yeah, exclusive. Like, it's it's yeah, not like why, it's not one yeah, or the why, other. <laughs> why could it not be both? I mean, it's, it's both. It's, you were you were uh, Nyla, Nyla, you were you sold out, out your like, enterprise <laughs> now. You're all white hat. <laughs> Nyla, you know? you were it's both. About, like you know what the bio, what the biohacking community was you know how it changed as a result of the pandemic. And I think one thing that happened was it, it just it legit became more global and better sourced logistically. Um, Tito Jankowski, um, who's been part of the the synthetic bio side of DIY bio for a very long time, you know, he was he's the he's one of the open PCR guys. Um, he uh, and some other people, you know, spun up a Slack and got regular meetings going. Um, you know, they were they were organizing shipments of masks from you know from China. They were. You know, they were figuring out, uh, you know, rapid testing approaches, um, you know, other kinds of medical device stuff. Um, you know, this, if, if memory serves, the, the, the ventilator that Italy used uh, that, um, that was based on a, um, uh, uh, a, a, a snorkeling mask. Yeah. Yeah, from from decathlon, like from the from the from from the you know basically the Dick Sporting Goods of Europe, um, like that that came out of uh, you know that came out of that space. So and now are we are we seeing like a a, a exp exponential like from from garage to commercial now, right? Because science I, we I, have garage science, and now we're seeing like. The development of the vaccine, for instance, it's been under it's been under a year. That hasn't happened in I don't know. I, I don't think I mean, I've I ever think, heard that it has happened. I think both small business and large business are starting to step in like wherever they can. You know, the the you know, like Decathlon had to divert its entire inventory of uh, of of snorkeling masks. Uh, you know, in order for that ventilator thing to happen, but they were happy to do it, and the manufacturer, you know, was was happy to have their entire inventory bought up, you know, but that's just one example. So uh, I wanted to ask a question. Um, one of my favorite books is The Emperor of All Maladies um, by Siddhartha Mukherjee, which is like a, basically a history of, or a biography of cancer through the ages. And like one of the things I was really struck by reading it was how recently we just had like no treatments for cancer. And, and so we really just like by, by modern standards, we're just experimenting on people like wildly. Um, and we've moved so far away from it that it sounded like some dystopian future to me reading about 50 years in the past. And I, I get the sense with like the pandemic, we're moving sort of back in this direction. And I'm, I'm just curious, you know, I, I, I personally haven't seen anything that's really made me think, oh, we're going too far, but I'm curious if you see anything like that. Um, you know, being a little bit um, closer to the bleeding edge of this. Nina, go ahead. I know you wanted to say something. I'm going to caveat this with the dog is snoring. So if you hear it, that's her. Um, so I want to go back to the comment really quickly about everybody becoming a white hat um, because of the how the biohacking village is, is going. Um, I love that comment because anybody that actually has had a real conversation with me, I am confrontational as and I love to counter people. I, I will fact check. I want to know where you got your, your ideas from. I want to know every single thing. Again, I want, I want your whole failure tree when we have a conversation about it. We need in this industry, the black hats, the, the, the gray hats, the white hats. We need everybody to be concerned about all the things that are going on here. So when, when it's the whole like, you know, we're all white hats now, to be a white hat, you still have to be a black hat. You still have to know what's going on on both sides. And to be a black hat, you still have to know white hat stuff. One of my favorite comments from a certain agency doing certain medical things is 
you know, we give out the manual and you know, everybody's going to read the manual and that's enough. And I was like, you think I care about your manual? I'm going to read your manual and I'm going to toss that shit in. I curse. I'm sorry. You can beat that later. You can toss that shit in, in, in your, With in your PG-13, fire. I believe you can say shit four times. We just did it twice. <laughs> so. You're right. It's the F. <laughs> you can only say once. So, um, because I'm going to talk that, that shit. Oops. So I'm going to read your manual and now I know what you want me to know. And now I'm going to do all the other things that I want to do. And I've had that conversation with them. And it's, it's that constant battle that, that I have had with government folks of we're going to do what we want with whatever information you give us. And then we're going to expand on it anyway. So you can play nice with us and get what we need from each other and let's move forward together. Or you can let the other people doing the other things come in and help you do that for you. And this is true. You know, this is true of information security in general. And you know, biology is just another kind of information. It's very wet, squishy information. Wet, squishy information. That's the, I'll add that to my list along with timey wimey <laughs> stuff. If you're a Doctor Who fans. Uh, so we- going back to something you were saying earlier, Gotti, about um, you know the like the administration. Uh, Oh no! Sorry, mm-hmm. Nino was saying that the 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 that like the Obama administration like was completely down, uh, you know, with uh, you know, with Garage Bio, and that's absolutely true. But one of the things that led up to that was straight up the CIA, uh, you know, hired a research firm, um, and you know they they actually contacted this. This was in about two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Uh, they contacted a lot of you know quote unquote leading figures at the time um, in the in the synthetic bio community because they were, you know, there was apparently concern at fairly high levels that, you know, this could lead to, you know, like terror threat. That was that that was the question I got all the time. Like, oh, are you know, are terrorists Everybody ignored you until Homeland to... happened, right? Well, the, right. <laughs> the thing is, like, if somebody wanted to get into like modifying bacteria directly they would have like mu- they would have a much better chance of actually learning what they need to learn um by just going to a community college and taking some lab classes like that's to be the fair you know, i know that you write science fiction and i never publish but i write bad science fiction but i'll say that um in 2000, actually, speaking of CCC, I was at the CCC camp in 2007. You weren't there, I think. And I gave this talk presenting a science fiction future, <clears throat> taking current models for security, whether it's uh, and trying to, uh, to build on them for the biological hacking world, not so much biohacking, going all the way to how do we update? Updates introduce new risks. Do we have centers? Do we send everybody there? Do we do it wirelessly? If we do that, how about locking down the body? Can the body still evolve? Can we? Can the body fix itself? Like, I kept going up and up and up and up on that, asking what happens when somebody uh, does something with Python and releases it to the world from their house. But that was science fiction, and it's not so much biohacking. One of the things that I want your opinion and the experts on, so I'll drag the conversation away for a minute if you're okay with that. And if you're not okay with that, I'll cry, is not specifically medical devices. That's a, that's a broken machine that I've been arping on since 2002 or so, and people still don't do anything about it. And honestly, we are all in security. We all know that we're the Cassandras of the world. We see the, the future happening. We cry. Nobody cares. Everybody ignores us. And when the bodies start getting way up there in the casualty lists, then when people start to listen to us, and I think it might be too late when the first warm happens. But we also not, need to not be FUD-based, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, doomsayers. We need to be security people who are good, enabling the business. It's so difficult. So I kind of limited myself to one thing nowadays, and I'm talking a lot to... This was before COVID. I left them alone completely since COVID started. But all these people who are doing infectious diseases research and are running around Africa and all around the world responding to incidents of Ebola or whatever it is. And the one question I had for them was... And it's truly amazing, even though there have been some breakdowns, to see how they, the, if somebody comes into a hospital, if you don't identify what it is, 24 hours later, I believe, you, you go and report it to WHO and so on and so forth. The entire system is incredible. <clears throat> This year, I changed my mind a little bit on that, but it's incredible on paper. They have, uh, their incident response is built on different um, parameters and hours, and I like the comparison. Oh, but bring Emerson it down. Tan, who does this, yeah. like, Emerson is amazing. I love Emerson. On the Just saw him yesterday on Clubhouse. But, no, no, somewhere else. Doesn't matter. But the thing is that for me, if tomorrow somebody died or other people started dying, right, scaring people again, 
the forensic examinations that are happening, and we have experts here, so they can correct me, would not even consider looking at, for example, the pacemaker. There is not even a, okay, Nina, go, go, Nina, go. Yes, go, you're the expert. Correct. Yes, go ahead. The, correct. Everything is falling under one thing right now. And we're not getting the actual cause and manners of death for all of the cases. I mean, would anybody, not, not, not to mention but even think about the doing the forensic examination for devices. Face, but we've got the internet of things that can stop your heart. Right. Yeah, but the thing is, it's not even that you, if, even if, for example, forensic examiner said, I find no reason why this person died and had a heart attack, they, and, they, and they, for some reason, would even think about the pacemaker, they would have no tools or, or, or training to be able to approach that and report that in any way to WHO. It's just completely irrelevant for them. So I have so many issues with everything you just said. Yes. So boom. Um, yeah. That's what I limit myself today in this field. That's what mm -hmm. I'm saying. But go, I Nina, go. So there's a, a doctor. His name is Christian Demeff. He runs the Cyber, uh, Cyber Summit, something like that. Cyber Med Summit. He runs the Cyber Med Summit. And all he does is these, um, in, in, in real time, oh, my God, I have so many thoughts. Okay. He runs this in real time action of bringing in a medical doctor and there's a patient, there's a real patient, and then it turns into a dummy and the patient's got, he's, he's getting um, pinged by, by the pacemaker and they don't know why. And the doctor does not know what's going on. The doctor's walking in completely blind and the doctor does the like, well, maybe we just need to pad. Oh, it didn't work. We don't know what's going on. And the patient flatlines, they come back up, things happen. Then um, they also do the, the insulin pump to figure out what's going on. So like the bolus went in, uh, the, the entirety of the insulin went in or it didn't. And Christian brings them out and says, so what did you think? What happened? And they're like, I was so confused. I didn't know what happened, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And every time I go through somebody's incident response for anything, I'm like, well, where's your medical device response? Because maybe this person just didn't die behind it. It was responding to the pacemaker or something else. So where's the actual pacemaker? And no, like nine times out of 10, they're like, oh, we sent it back to get like re-imaged and could do whatever. And I'm like, great, you need to, you needed to do something with that. We are not. But they all work by checklists. And as long as the industry right. doesn't care about this and doesn't think about this. I mean, I, I've met some people at the World Economic Forum who say, no, no, we are X company and we absolutely care about cybersecurity with our devices. Right. But with that said, I'm talking to developers. That's what I actually go and check. And the developers don't even consider currently cybersecurity. And I don't blame these companies at all. But then I'm saying uh, one of my things to do, because Cassandra effect and trying to convince people to invest in something where they don't see the need to yet, and it would stop their business, is to kind of convince them, look at what happened to all the previous technological waves. And all these parameters of the vulnerability is getting discovered, criminals start to use it, there is, and so on and so forth, until a warm up. And then, well, the thing is, when I look at this, last time I checked statistics, I think there were 3 million or 4 million pacemakers in the U.S. I think there are 800,000 new ones every year, and that's in the U.S. alone, not considering all other medical devices. Yeah, when in the same I conference, I met Meredith, there, there were guys from, a con I think, a university in Seattle. They showed 8,000 vulnerabilities in a pacemaker back then. Mm -hmm. um, so that was just after my presentation. I wish it was before so I could have edited it to my presentation. <laughs> but the thing is now, what happens tomorrow, and I hate this. I hate that I'm reduced to being the security professional I was when I was 20, and I can't discuss in better terms that are business oriented and strategic oriented but what happens when there is a worm and not only can we not tell it's coming from pacemakers and not only do we have no tools to deal with that and not only do we have no uh, capability to do incident response right the effect is devastating and every i would i care right now about more about terrorism about iran about cyber security finally which is great right how do we make people care and i have no answer I think you got it in one when you said checklists, hospitals run on checklists and, you know, it somehow, um, you know, hospital protocols need to add preserve evidence to heart failures with pacemakers. They need to preserve a lot of things. And that comes along with documentation too. their document, their policies and standards and procedures, everything that you can think of needs to be updated and they need to have deviations, those tabletop exercises where it says, okay, if X, Y, Z may happen, we need to divert to here. If this happens, we need to divert there. It's a lot of um, 
I think it's a lot of, you know, top down. I'm really sorry for cutting you off for a second, execs. Najda. I really am sorry for cutting you off. I got to say that the viewers don't only see the person who is speaking. And I constantly look to Nina because she's so excited. She's jumping up and down <laughs> in her chair. It's something we get to see and enjoy and nobody else can see. So I just wanted to cut you off for a second just to appreciate Nina for being so excited about this and doing so much. Please go <laughs> this on. This is Najda. her thing. This is her thing. I, I love it. But like I'm saying, I, I think that documentation and, and you know, really going back and seeing what you have on hand and adapting. You're not going to get everything, but if you start paying attention and getting, um, you know, being aware of, you know, incidences and what's happening and updating accordingly, you can put yourself in a better position. It is no longer, you know, if it's going to happen, it's, it's really a matter of when. And a lot of times, a lot of things are happening a lot faster than people can acknowledge. And I think if, you know, we all start to talk about it and really enforce it, I think we can start to change. I don't know how long it'll take, but I think that that's something that we can start doing. Go ahead, Nina. I'm going to counter you. So working in the hospitals, it's a conglomerate of every different thing, every medical device that is completely different and completely um, differently programmed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when we leave everything up to the, the hospital itself, that is a lot of responsibility for one entity that is an ecosystem of a lot to do. So I think it, it requires the, the manufacturer to also have an impetus of something happened, you need to send it back to us. And we also need to check logs and we also need to forensically check this thing. But we also don't thing. check BIOSes and we do have access to BIOSes. So I just don't know when that's ever going to happen. Yeah, I think it's, it's really communication. It's like the manufacturer, the medical device manufacturers have to communicate with the hospital. The hospital has to communicate with the patients. It has to do with open communication. They have to care first, though, don't they? They, have to, they do have, have to care. To they, they have to change contract. everything. Everything It has to be built into the contract. Like just because you hire the medical device to send you this, you need to check with them to make sure that what you've hired them for or got Tell us how you really feel happening. about that, Najla. I'm telling you right now, <laughs> just because you buy something, Double check it if you can. Like, yes, you have these contracts and things, but you have to check it. Um, I think that this is a good conversation. So I'm, I'm going to end it here and ask the la very last question. So what what is next? What And, and you can take that wherever you want to take it, but leave it to two things that you can tell me that you think that's next for the biohacking um, community, uh, village, industry. Um, what, what are two things that you see next? Nina, since you're... There, since I'm writing, because I take notes, um, <laughs> I think there's going to be more. I really dislike organized people. They make me look bad. I, You'll be okay, Gotti. I really, and I, I want more hackers in the government. I want more hackers in the manufacturers because we have that insight. We have that curiosity. We are not the normal thinkers of anything. So we can bring that insight to them and do the things. I think a lot of what... Um, so my second thing is the, the people that were manufacturing things that maybe didn't get funding are going to push the boundaries of all things medical and medicine and health and create their own way to make healthcare better and push their way into it. Yeah, I'll agree with that. Uh, I was going to say, you know, my, my short term uh, you know, thing I hope to see happening is, um, you know, there's more collaboration um, uh, between individuals, industry and government. And then, you know, my, my longer term moonshot, you know, I research this once a year is I want ship scale atomic force magnetometers <laughs> because that way we can do magnetoencephalography that's like mobile and doesn't require enormous cryo magnets and stuff. That's going to really change brain computer interfaces in my opinion, because it's basically the resolution of a, uh, yeah, of, uh, an fMRI with the speed of an EEG. That's fast and cool. <laughs> um, but I just want to say I am thankful that you all are spending your Saturday um, watching and sharing what you know here um, about biohacking. I think we have, I think we're making progress. Um, and I think that these conversations, good, bad, or indifferent, um, are very good because there's no one way to do anything. You know, um, the more we open the communication between different professionals in the industry, the better we'll be. Um, and as I think, you know, slowly but surely it's happening. Um, and I hope that, you know, 
in a year or two, we'll be having different conversations and things have been put into place for that. I'm with okay. you 100%. I want to I wanna say, uh, I feel like I'm the old guy now, like, get off my lawn, <laughs> because I've been there so many times, and I would say two years from now, and it was 20, and nobody cares any yet anymore, or whatever. But I hope you're right, because that is, again, something I care about deeply, so I appreciate all the insights. Honestly, this has been really fun. We have a lot of different shows with people who are experts, and people who are passionate, but the excellence that I got from you, know, you Najla, Nina, and Meredith, I, I, I like for many, many years now, but I like to more new, to new people now, which is also good. Um, one thing I want to say before we kind of summarize this and move on is as security people, when I brought us there, you guys were all optimistic and strategic. We scare people. And when it comes down to it, the sun will come up tomorrow if there is a catastrophic event and we'll get together and we'll solve our problems and we'll move on. And that's something we need to remember. And we are becoming more professional as security professionals in general in talking to the business and in making our case and being a part of the general um, the world around us as opposed to being stuck in our, up our own asses and not being able to see what's going on. So I really appreciate that. So Najla, just your moderation, your feedback, your bringing this up to the strategy level. I really appreciate that. Nina, you're 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 awesome. I just I just love you. You're amazing, and and Karen and I are arguing whether one of us should try and hire you and who should it be. And if you even want to come work with us because you're so awesome, you would not even look at us, right? And Meredith, as always, I, mean, I run clinics in New York City. I'm just saying. <laughs> Karen is a CTO of a company that does some of this stuff now, and uh, Meredith, it's just uh, you're amazing. But I don't care about any of that because I'm just excited to see you again. But I will, I will ask Karen. Presumably now that we're because the... she's, sorry, go ahead. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you. Whenever some of my friends get together, the first thing they get to do, and I don't know why, is put me down and laugh at me. I don't know what it's about me, but they enjoy it so much. But uh, Carl, I can see you nodding over there. I don't like you anymore. But um, Karen, you're new to this. You're a technologist and you're a business person, although I don't like that. You're, you're a startup person. And um, you listened to us for the past hour. Uh, no, it's to them for the past hour. I just interrupted sometimes. And I wonder what comes to mind. Are you scared? Are you excited? Do you want to know about Nina's uh, you know, implants? Like what, what, what do you want? <laughs> like, what are your thoughts? Um, I don't know if I'm as, I don't know if I would characterize myself as new to this. Uh, I'm, I, I, I literally kind of work in this field. Um, but uh, I mean, what scared me was when Nina said 13 EMRs, that's my nightmare. Um, I work on, <laughs> I, I'm actually I am actually excited about the role of of software in in this field and in some of this um, and it's a mess right now for a lot of reasons that there's no time to go into but you know how do you get that log whenever something happens I think you know really putting the right amount of content in front of the right person at the right time through software systems you know if you have to document it it's like hey download this write this number you know there's actually a lot of of power there um, and so I'm, I'm actually just passionate about the the role of software in some of this and excited about um, kind of like the, the, just the fact that other people are, are thinking about this, you know, what happens with your heart, your heart implant. Um, and I, uh, yeah, I, I hear thinking you. about hearing more about all the cool shit I could implant into my body. Like, <laughs> because <laughs> tattoos are just not enough anymore. No, but I'll say that um, I, I was talking to Mike Fiedler, you know, a mutual friend of ours. The oh, other yeah. day. I think you were about to hire him and then you met him you met him again on my Facebook page and I think it was like 10 years ago. Remember that? Yeah. That's how we met. Yeah. Okay. So um he was great to work with. He's awesome. He's, he's really cool. So I was talking to him a little bit about philosophy of technology out of nowhere. Don't ask me why. And a lot of my spiel is kind of about I see Carl writing down, shut up, we need to wrap up, but before he even shows me the sign. But a lot of what I look at is abstraction layers and how we add on uh, instruction layers up top of abstraction layers. And I think that is Really cool. Wrap it up, Gadi. I see that. Uh, that is really cool because these abstraction layers allow us to do more and give access to technology to more people, but at the same time, they leave a basis that's very shaky. And trying to figure out how to unwind all of these abstraction layers to understand a problem happened. How do we figure out what that problem is? How do we figure out how to even approach it? On the one hand, we have progress, but on the other hand, we leave a lot of vulnerable infrastructure. And my, my spiel on that is usually Y2K. And how when we actually solve the problem, people will tell us, well, nothing happened. So what did you do? Why did we pay you? Right. So <laughs> just some finishing thoughts. But on that note, 
thank you all. We are going to be on April, tw- uh, we're going to do this again on April 10th with a show on Mexicanics, I believe I'm pronouncing it right, with uh, David Balls, John Picaccio, Hector Gonzalez, Gabriela, uh, Damian M- Miraveta, and Libla Brenda with the f- help of uh, Sarah Felix working together with our own Alan on creating a show about art and Latin America and a lot of really cool shit in between. So that was our first shit. Oh, ouch. <laughs> I just need the fifth one. No, no longer PG-13. So that's going to be cool. Please, fo- we, we are moving from a Zoom-based uh, event to more streaming on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube. So follow us to know when this is going on. And just thank you. We're going to stay here with our panelists for a few minutes, but we'll say goodbye to you. You've been an awesome audience, even though I can't see you. So I'm guessing maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you all suck, but I love you anyway. See you next time. Bye-bye.